Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our live session once again on hair wellness. I'm Deepti Diwan, your host for today, and we shall be talking about hair care in winter. Our hair is our crowning glory, and indeed, it symbolizes our personality and tells people so much about us. Strong and healthy hair can indeed boost our confidence. So it's very important to protect our hair and keep it looking gorgeous every single day and in all seasons. This winter, let's care about our hair from the roots to the ends. And today we have the opportunity to engage in a very private and intimate conversation with Dr. Pooja Chopra. Dr. Pooja Chopra is an expert dermatologist and dermatosurgeon with an extensive experience of 20 years. She has hands-on experience in using the latest aesthetic treatments, including indication for lasers, hair reduction, pigmentation, PRP, mesotherapy, chemical peels, microdermabrasion for acne scars, facial rejuvenation. She has an expertise in treating extensive range of dermatological conditions related to skin, hair, nails, and great surgical skills towards electrodesiccation of warts, skin tags, mole surgery, repair, etc. Dr. Chopra practices at Akash Healthcare, Ayushman Hospital, Bhagat Chandra Hospital, and runs her private practice at Dwarka. Welcome, Dr. Chopra. Good evening, everyone, and it's great to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, doctor, today our viewers are really looking forward. Today we will talk about hair care. Ke mein. Toh, yes. um, one of the most common conditions that people face during winter is that of dandruff. So uh, doctor, please tell us what exactly is dandruff? Okay, so dandruff per se is not a medical condition. It's very common. It's not a disease as such. Dandruff, as even a layman can say, you know, kimchi dandruff ho gaya, or I have dandruff. So dandruff is a very layman's term, which is used for scaling of the scalp. Okay, so dandruff uh, without any symptoms goes unnoticed because it is basically uh, flakes that uh, occur on the scalp, and unless it turns into seborrheic dermatitis or an eczema, that's when there is redness, inflammation, and that's when the patient reports in the dermatology hopefully saying that the dandruff is bothering the patient. So if the patient is not concerned about the symptoms, dandruff per se is a very common uh, condition which 90% of the time goes unnoticed. However, when the scalp, uh, the, uh, the scales, they become clumped and they're visible. And in winter, especially people tend to wear black. They're visible on your uh, clothing. They're visible on your face, on your eyelids. That's when it becomes a dermatitis and it definitely needs uh, medical attention. Okay. So, uh, yeah, going into the uh, medical aspect of it. So, uh, dandruff uh, is, uh, so our scalp basically has uh, yeast uh, called malassezia and uh, uh, a symbiotic relationship with some bacteria like propionobacterium acnes. Now, these are all harmless and they're sitting on the sebaceous areas of our scalp. Absolutely harmless, not causing any problem. However, when there is overactivity of this malassezia yeast, this gives rise to Okay. Uh, going forward, uh, uh, dandruff uh, just causes uh, visible scales without any itching. There is no visible inflammation. However, uh, there is a microscopic inflammation and that's when the patient complains of an itchy scalp. That's when the patient comes to with itching. That's when you have to address the itching. So if we go um, looking into the uh, pathology, that is the cause, why exactly, what is happening in the scalp that is causing dandruff. So as we all know, our uh, skin sheds, there's a cell turnover. The skin sheds its skin, uh, the cells every four to six weeks. Okay, so when these uh, scales they uh, reach the surface, that's when you see them as shedding of scales. Okay, overactivity of this malassezia yeast gives rise to clumping of scales. So, जहाँ वो flaky dandruff होता है, वो clumps बन जाते हैं, मोटे मोटे clumps बन जाते हैं, and that's when you have dandruff turning into an eczema or a seborrheic dermatitis. Super added bacterial infection gives rise to a very itchy kind of an odor. There's a smell that uh, is associated with dandruff. So that is because of the 
uh, super added bacterial infection. It's because of the oily secretion. And that's when the patient has redness, itching, and reports to us in the OPD for uh, treatment of dandruff. Over to you, Deepthi. Okay. Well, thank you, doctor. And um, doctor, uh, people who suffer from dandruff, they really yeah. dread winter season. So yes. what is the link between dandruff and winter? Okay, so contrary to belief, people believe that uh, dryness uh, causes dandruff. Okay? That uh, uh, if it's dry, then dandruff will be more. So this is partially true. To some extent, it's true. But we must remember that the basic pathology causing dandruff is excessive sebaceous secretion, means excessive oily secretion. The, uh, the fact that uh, the theory that you know dryness causes uh, dandruff kind of contra uh, indicates that. So what happens is uh, in our body, we have sebaceous rich areas like the scalp, you have your face, your trunk and upper back. So these areas are rich in sebaceous glands. What happens in winters is that the atmosphere is very dry. It is devoid of moisture. People tend to stay indoors, stay in front of heaters, uh, use uh, very hot wat water to bathe or wash their hair, which makes the skin, the scalp, extremely dry. Now, to counteract that, there is an excessive oily production. Okay. Now, this excessive oily production activates your malassezia yeast. And this malassezia yeast starts uh, dividing. It increases in number. Now, this malassezia, it acts on the uh, oil, the uh, oil present, uh, the sebaceous secretion with the help of certain enzymes or lipases and converts it into fatty acids. And this kind of aggravates the dandruff. Okay. So the, uh, if we look at winters, it is basically the dryness. The dryness per se is not causing dandruff. Dryness is causing an overactivity, a counteractive production of sebaceous secretion which in turn aggravates the dandruff. Okay. So externally it is dry, but yes, internally externally your it is body dry. is yes. Uh, yes. secreting sebum. Yes, so, yes. So exactly. That's so that's a misconception that most people have that, you know, uh, dryness causes dandruff, which to some extent is okay, but then the real pathology is excessive sebum on your scalp. Okay. Thank you, doctor. So then in that case, doctor, uh, what? how does one avoid... Uh, that condition, how does one avoid getting dandruff? Do you uh, control, um, because you cannot control the sebaceous glands? Yes, we cannot. Uh, so so uh, 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 a very popular belief amongst us Indians is that if you have dandruff, oil your hair. You know, if you oil your hair, the dandruff goes away. And uh, the, the mantra for uh, treating dandruff is oiling, which is not true. Because... Uh, we, I mean, most people believe that's the dry scalp causing the dryness. So if you oil your scalp, then the dandruff goes away, which is not true. Uh, so uh, the certain precautions that you need to take uh, during winters, uh, starting with um, don't use very, very hot water to uh, wash your scalp. It should be lukewarm. It should not be hot, not towards the hotter side. Prolonged baths are also a no-no, uh, just a quick shower and a quick wash. Uh, avoid blow drying your hair, avoid uh, using uh, chemical products, avoid uh, excessive exposure to sun. And if you do need to oil your hair, uh, you can definitely do that maybe for a couple of hours. So contrary to popular belief that an overnight application of oil is extremely important for the bounce and, you know, luster, uh, that, that's not true. A couple of hours should suffice. So even if you have dandruff, even though we tell the patient not to oil, but if the patient is very adamant, you can oil your hair maybe for one or two hours and use a regular shampoo to rinse it off maybe once a week. Okay. So, uh, overnight oiling, um, uh, use of hot water uh, and your cosmetic products, all these things uh, can be avoided. And of course, the role of diet uh, goes a long way, not just in dandruff, in maintaining good health of your hair and skin. So a good protein-rich diet, um, uh, biotin supplements. Uh, and of course, if the dandruff is bothering, then of course, uh, there are medications and you have anti-dandruff shampoos that uh, play a role. So right. That comes in later um, sure. when we need medical, when we seek medical help for dandruff. Right. 
we'll come to that doctor in uh, detail later uh, so doctor you uh, mentioned um, the uh, dandruff and seborrheic dermatitis yes. Um, yes so from what we understand it's um, the same thing but the uh, extent uh, is different the extent of uh, yes uh, yes inflammation perhaps so, so then, for, um, how does a person differentiate between the two and when does a person actually get worried about it and seek medical attention? Right. So dandruff per se is a non-inflammatory uh, uh, component of a seborrheic dermatitis. So if you look at dandruff, the scales are whitish, flaky, um, might, might not associated with itching, and they're restricted only to the scalp, mainly the hairy areas, the scalp. Where dandruff turns into seborrheic dermatitis, you have certain changes. It's not only the scalp, you have flaking or whitish uh, flakes over your eyebrows, eyelashes, the nasolabial folds. You can have uh, rashes behind your ears, the retroauricular areas. You can also develop small papules or acne-like regions on your upper chest and back. So then we know that the dandruff has uh, progressed to what is known as seborrheic dermatitis. Seborrheic dermatitis is an inflammatory form of dandruff wherein there is redness. Inflammation manifests itself as redness. They might be itching. And the scales, instead of being white, they're slightly greasy. They have a slightly yellowish tinge to it. Why? Because the malassezia has uh, acted on these scales and converted the sebum into your free fatty acids. So they give a slightly greasy, yellowish texture. The uh, scales tend to uh, get clumped near the hair follicle rather than dandruff, which is kind of flaky and tends to fall. When it becomes seborrheic, the flakes become clumped and uh, uh, are adherent to the uh, hair shaft, the hair root and the hair shaft. And uh, associated with symptoms, so the patient does know that, yes, this is something more than dandruff that's bothering me and I need to seek medical help. Okay. Sure. And uh, doctor, could you please elaborate a little more on the etiology of dandruff? Uh, what exactly is the cause? You mentioned uh, melissezia. Uh, could you please elaborate a little bit more on that and any other microorganisms if they have a role? Yes, yeah, so we have uh, melissezia is the yeast that is uh, mainly responsible. We have propionobacterium acnes, propionobacterium epidermidis. So they have a very uh, nice symbiotic relationship and uh, not causing any symptoms and you know sitting in our sebaceous areas. It's just when the pathology sets in when they become active. So on one hand, your malassezia is getting active. On the other hand, there is super added bacterial infection with propionobacterium acnes, which uh, gives rise to your rancid odor. It can cause secondary bacterial infection. And these propionobacterium acnes is also uh, associated with your papular lesions or acne lesions that come along with seborrheic dermatitis. So a patient can prevent with papule or acne form regions, which again are a part and parcel of your seborrheic dermatitis. So we have uh, malassezia, we have propionobacterium, uh, a couple of uh, species. Uh, when this balance, the balance between all these microorganisms is disturbed, that's when the symptomology arises. Okay. Thank you, doctor. And uh, doctor, you mentioned some external factors like, uh, for example, going out in the sunlight, too much of sunlight, and uh, um, excessive using of uh, the hair dryer, perhaps. Yes, um, yes. Uh, also, we've heard uh, shampooing your hair too much. Or yes. Or frequent combing. Do these things frequent combing, things? yes. All these things, they take away the essential oils uh, from the scalp, you know, uh, frequent uh, sitting in the sun or frequent washing of hair uh, or using chemicals, whether it's in shampoos or your hair products. Then again, takes away the essential oils from your scalp, makes your scalp extremely dry. And like we discussed uh, initially, makes the hair more prone to dandruff. Absolutely. So if we can avoid it as far as possible, especially if a person is prone to dandruff, he or she can avoid and take the necessary precautions so that uh, the uh, disease does not become, uh, does not go to the eczematous stage of uh, seborrheic dermatitis. Right. Uh, so, uh, would you be able to uh, give some guidance to our viewers as to how many times is it uh, considered good enough to comb your hair or wash your hair with a shampoo? Uh, the See, summers, yeah, summers definitely uh, people feel the need to wash the hair more frequently compared to winters. 
So I personally feel twice a week is more than enough, but summers definitely it can be thrice a week as well. Women tend to wash their hair uh, at a lesser rate than men, of course. Men anyway wet their hair every day. But using a shampoo every day is a definite no-no. You can, uh, I mean, there's a difference between the way males and females wash their hair, the frequency and the products used. So women especially uh, tend to be more cautious about uh, their hair wash schedule. So during winters, I think twice a week should suffice. You can use oil, like I said, for a couple of hours uh, uh, prior to shampoo once a week, that if it's absolutely necessary. And uh, combing definitely in the morning, uh, uh, I mean, some people have that uh, obsessive, compulsive uh, habit of, you know, combing their hair every hour, every two hours. So that should not be done because the hair becomes weak and breaks from the sharp. So uh, uh, twice a day, definitely. And again, it depends on your uh, uh, whether you are staying at home or you're stepping out for work. So all these factors play a role in uh, deciding how often you must comb your hair. Um, Sure. And uh, doctor, things like, um, you know, using helmets, wearing helmets, um, you know, hair caps, do these things also cause more dandruff? Uh, they do cause occlusion. So what is the, uh, again, the main root cause, what do helmets do? They cause occlusion, scarves and things like that. They occlude. They do not let your scalp breathe. So again, there is occlusion, which again can uh, aggravate uh, uh, dandruff. Again, wearing a helmet is a necessary uh, evil, if I might say, for dandruff patients, but then that cannot be avoided. Wearing scarf or a bandana, especially if you have a dandruff tendency, that can be avoided. That can definitely be avoided. Because again, occlusion will again give rise to you know, excessive sebum, and then the vicious cycle begins. So uh, one thing leads to the other. So something that can be avoided, that can definitely be done. So wearing uh, scarves and, uh, of course, when you're stepping out in the cold, in air regions which, is, which are very cold, you have to wear a woolen cap and you have to wear a scarf and you know stuff like that. So in such cases, you take adequate precautions when you come back and uh, uh, do your regular hair care so that you can avoid uh, dandruff. Right, absolutely. Thank you so much, doctor. And um, uh, doctor, what is the connection between dandruff and hair loss? A lot of people who suffer from dandruff yes. also complain of hair loss. Yes, is there yes. a connection between the two? Definitely there is. Definitely there is. Not, I wouldn't say there's a direct connection, but uh, dandruff, like I said, per se, when it is unnoticed, it's not uh, a leading cause of hair loss. But again, when dandruff becomes a seborrheic dermatitis, it becomes an eczema it makes your hair uh, weak and tends to break easily. And of course, uh, uh, people who tend to comb their hair very often uh, and use uh, blow dry very, on a very regular basis, use hair dryers. So of course, the hair root becomes weak. People using chemicals on their hair, hair uh, dyes, hair colors, though they are a necessary evil, but they do tend to make your hair slightly weak and more prone to hair fall. So dandruff uh, as such, per se, uh, without any symptoms, would not be a leading cause of hair loss. But yes, when it becomes a seborrheic dermatitis, when there's inflammation, there's redness, there's itching, when the patient tends to itch. So patient sometimes has uncontrollable itching. So constant itching also weakens your hair shaft and that causes hair loss, hair breakage. Right. And then would you recommend to that person not to itch, like to you know, uh, touch the hair at that time? As yes, as definitely. Well. Easier said than done because easier a patient said. who easier said than done, a patient who has itching because of dandruff is, is uh, very agitated and very concerned because um, he or she feels inferior while stepping out. The dandruff is visible, not only on the clothes, it's visible on the scalp, it's visible on your face. So at that times the patient's very concerned. So you we have to give them some anti-inflammatory, some antifungals and some anti-dandruff shampoos to uh, address the issue. And uh, uh, assurance is very important. So I tell all my patients, the first thing I tell them that, look, dandruff is not a disease. You're not suffering from any disease. So just remember that. It'll, it's just a tendency that you have, which will go away. So have patience, it will go away. So you have to patient. Uh, uh, counseling is very important uh, when it comes to conditions like uh, dandruff. Absolutely. Thank you, doctor. 
And uh, doctor, finally, uh, coming to the treatment options, uh, what are the different treatment options that you would give to a person suffering from dandruff? Okay, so we have, uh, we can divide them into oral therapy and topical therapy. So uh, a flaky dandruff would definitely be treated with an anti-dandruff shampoo containing uh, ketoconazole, which is an antifungal agent, along with zinc pyrethone. We have uh, shampoos containing salicylic acid. We have shampoos containing coal tar, which are used for severe forms of dandruff. There's something known as seborrheic dermatitis. There is something known as sebopsoriasis. Uh, that is another severe form wherein we have really thick adherence uh, scales which are stuck to the scalp which do not go even with a regular anti-dandruff shampoo or an anti-fungal shampoo. So in those cases, we need a tar-based shampoo which are slightly harsh, but then yes, they have to be given to make sure that the scales dissolve so that the scalp can breathe. Uh, in severe cases, sometimes we do need to give uh, a steroid lotion as well for local application to, again, um, uh, improve circulation and to uh, help the scales to dissolve so that the anti-dandruff shampoo can work on that particular area. Apart from these shampoos, uh, we definitely have to give uh, antihistamines, which take care of the itching. We need to give some antifungals as well, which take care of the, uh, the yeast. And sometimes antibiotics are given when there is secondary infection, when we have formation of pustules or yellowish uh, secretion. So in some cases, we need to give antibiotics as well, not on every, in every patient, but yes, when there is secondary bacterial infection, that also plays a role. Over to you, Lee. Absolutely. Thank you, doctor. Uh, with that, we've uh, completed the set of questions. I think it's time to take a look at what our viewers have to ask us. So um, we shall take a look at the chat box and uh, see if any questions we have. Sure, we have a viewer who wants to know, can dandruff spread among family members? That's a very interesting question, yes. And in fact, a lot of people ask me the same. So I always tell them that per se, by just, you know, uh, uh, it's not communicable, but using the same towel, you know, using the same towel or uh, 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 using the hair, not, not using the hair products, the same towel or, you know, wearing the same clothes and stuff like that. So just avoid that, especially a towel. So per se, it's not communicable. It's not like you're sitting across or you're touching the hair or you're combing somebody else's hair, it, uh, it gets um, transferred from one family member to another. But using the same comb, using the same towel, that definitely has to, something which is very personal to you. You should not share that with another family member if you have that. Okay, sure. And but it's uh, not like if you stick, it's, it's not like if you say, sleep on the same pillow that you can have. No, I mean, or if you use the same sheet or, uh, you know, that, that's not true. It's just the personal products. Uh, I would feel that just keep them separate. Right. Absolutely. And uh, doctor, can dandruff lead to hair loss? I think you've already... Yes, we've that. already touched on that. Definitely, yes, it can. And we uh, just discussed how it makes the hair uh, very weak because of constant scratching, because of the secondary bacterial infection, the root becomes weak and it leads to hair fall. Definitely, yes. Right. Uh, our next viewer would like to know, can I cure my dandruff with anti-dandruff shampoos? Definitely you can. Now, it depends on the extent of your dandruff, whether it's uh, confined only to your scalp or it is affecting your other seborrheic areas like your face, your trunk or your upper back. So you can consult your dermatologist who will assess the extent of dandruff and will give you the uh, relevant anti-dandruff shampoo uh, pertaining to your uh, needs. Okay. And uh, uh, how frequently can we use anti-dandruff shampoo? That's again, uh, very interesting. So um, uh, the uh, tar-based shampoos, which are very harsh, uh, uh, they uh, also make your scalp very dry and frizzy. So uh, we start with maybe twice a week. Again, depends on the extent of the dandruff. So initially what I do is tell the patient to use it maybe on alternate days. And uh, subsequently, maybe after a week or 10 days, we can make it twice a week. As the patient gets better, we can use it once a week, once in 10 days. But always tell your patient that an anti-dandruff shampoo, if you have a dandruff tendency, an anti-dandruff shampoo has to be used on a regular basis. Don't treat it as a medicine. Just like, a use, like you use a normal cosmetic shampoo, once your dandruff is under control, 
you must use an anti dandruff shampoo once in a while maybe right. once a week once in 10 days but you must not stop it so that it does not go back to its original form again right. so you must remember that right thank you doctor and uh, our next question is uh, does do vitamin and mineral tablets have any treating dandruff uh i wouldn't say treating dandruff but yes uh, in overall growth and uh, uh, to add uh, strength to your hair we have uh, uh, biotin that's the main uh, vitamin that uh, helps in hair growth so um, uh, a protein rich diet multivitamins which are rich in omega 3 um, biotin vitamin d vitamin b12 all these play a role in the overall uh, health of the hair not just dandruff just the overall Uh, hair uh, health health of your hair okay uh, doctor would uh, oily food be not very suitable for dandruff or yes i always tell patients that uh, uh, not that you have to stop it completely but just cut down on oily intake cut down on fried cut down on your carbs because uh, like we said it is excessive sebum excessive sebaceous secretion that is causing your dandruff so i wouldn't say stop it completely but if you can cut down on it well and good it will just help you uh, keep uh, your skin and hair healthy okay well hope that helps our viewers um uh, doctor can hair mask help in dandruff clearance hair mask is a very cosmetic uh, it's a very cosmetic therapy i i don't think it's going to help in dandruff as per se and in fact if you have dandruff i don't think it's a good idea to go in for a hair mask initially uh, you need to first control the dandruff make sure scalp is clean and then you can uh, go in for a hair mask which is more of a cosmetic therapy than um, a medical uh, kind of a therapy so uh, it's entirely your choice it's a uh, patient's choice you want to go in for it definitely yes but don't think that it's going to take care of your dandruff no it won't right Uh, because there's a lot of home remedies available online, right? People go in yes, for curd so, hair mask. Oh, yes. That, so uh, sometimes, like I said, they help in the initial stages when you have just flaking. You know, so we have curd, we have uh, uh, the Ayurvedic uh, products like we have uh, Amla, we have uh, Rita, Chika Kaya. You know, these have anti-inflammatory properties. Coconut oil, as such, has antimicrobial properties. Uh, people use curd, basin. They use these packs. So in the so it should not be used to treat dandruff just as a basic you know uh, just a hair mask or a hair pack for healthy uh, growth of the hair or to add that uh, luster and the bounce to the hair if yeah. there is a dandruff problem you must seek uh, medical help for a uh, to get an anti dandruff shampoo and these things can be used as a maintenance therapy once the dandruff is under control you can use them there's no harm in using home remedies not at all right and uh, doctor um, a lot of teenagers uh, complain a lot about dandruff and acne so any particular advice that you would like to give them yes so we must remember that acne and dandruff they are related excessive sebaceous secretion on your scalp produces dandruff and excessive sebaceous secretion on the face gives rise to acne now uh, patients who are in the age group of 12 to 18 then the teenage so we have the onset of puberty onset of menarche we have a lot of hormonal changes that are going on because of which these sebaceous glands they become active so sometimes it's not in our hands to control these hormones so how do we take care of our skin and hair so again like we just discussed cut down on your oily intake cut down on your carbohydrates keep your face free of oil by using a good face wash depending on your type of skin whether you have dry skin combination skin or oily skin hair care like we just discussed if you do have dandruff issues you can use an anti dandruff shampoo uh, off and on depending on the extent of dandruff and if there is secondary bacterial infection you need to seek medical help avoid oily sticky creams on your face avoid uh, uh, cosmetic products on your hair as far as possible i would say uh, avoid hair color as far as possible as long as you can you know extend it avoid all these things and uh, yeah you're good to go but just remember the pathology is the same people think that acne is different and dandruff is dryness but no the pathology is the same it just manifests itself in a different way so that's what um, surprises people ki oily secretion is causing pimples on face how can it cause dryness on your scalp 
So we must remember it's the same pathology and take adequate precautions to uh, take care of the face and your hair as well. Okay. Uh, well, that was indeed the next question. Hair dyeing, can it lead to dandruff? So I think you... Yeah, hair dyeing wouldn't uh, directly lead to dandruff. I wouldn't say directly lead to dandruff, but hair dyeing uh, sometimes causes dryness of skin. And like we discussed in the beginning, how dryness, uh, to counteract the excessive dryness, the body starts producing excessive sebum. And then it's a vicious cycle. Uh, again, your hair color makes the skin dry. It can cause uh, skin irritation. It can weaken your roots as well. And I have seen a lot of patients using hair color. Of course, I wouldn't want to name the brand uh, causing patchy hair loss. There's a patchy hair loss wherein the scalp is clearly visible because of use of hair color. So uh, no matter how much they claim that uh, it's ammonia free and uh, um, XYZ free, they do contain chemicals. But then again, it's a necessary evil, like I say. So uh, yes. there's no life without hair color. So I, I don't think I would say don't use it, but then uh, try and use it when absolutely necessary. And use a, start with a good brand. Good, uh, don't go in for something which is reasonable or, uh, uh, you know, uh, OTC or something. Go, go, go with a good brand so that you don't uh, develop complications. And uh, always do a patch test before you use a hair color so that even if you know there's something happening, um, at least you're prepared for it. Right. So I don't think it causes dandruff directly, but indirectly, maybe like uh, we just discussed. Right. Absolutely no compromise on quality there because it's yes. your hair after all. Yes, yes. definitely, definitely, absolutely. Uh, doctor, um, our viewer would like to know how to prevent the dry scalp. I, I just lost your voice. Can you just repeat that? Uh, how to prevent dry scalp. How to prevent dry scalp. Yeah, so if you have dry scalp, like I said, uh, uh, you can oil your hair once a week. Okay, and... Uh, Overnight uh, application of oil is not required at all. You can uh, use uh, uh, oil like coconut oil or olive oil uh, for one or two hours. You can apply a hot towel and uh, rinse it off with your regular shampoo. You can use a conditioner. Conditioner, again, should be used uh, maybe once a week or once in two weeks, not with every wash because, again, it makes your hair limp if you use it very often. It makes your hair very thin and limp. So uh, contrary to belief that conditioner adds uh, manageability to your hair, you should not use it with every wash. Okay. Yeah. And uh, doctor, uh, does exercise play an important role in controlling dandruff? Exercise just improves the circulation. It improves the blood circulation to your scalp, to your face. So that I don't think it helps to control dandruff as such. It just helps the circulation. So a good circulation means healthy hair, healthy scalp, so uh, it's not a treatment, an option that if you exercise, the dandruff goes off. No. Right. It's just for overall health, right? Overall health, yes. Overall health, definitely, yes. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much, doctor. With that, we've come to the end of uh, all our questions. And uh, indeed, I have to say, it was an insightful and very informative talk. Uh, we, val we thank you for your valuable time and for answering all questions. So thank you for having me here. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you for valuable time.